morning. I'm Rick Rausch. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne School of Land and Environment, and it's my pleasure to be your host this morning for the, this session of the Festival of Ideas, where we're we'll be talking about feeding 10 billion people and sustaining the planet. I would first like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the tr traditional custodians of the land in which we are gathered and pay respect to their elders past and present. Along with that, I'd like to note that and ask you to stop off at the Bunjil's Nest project, which is on the ground floor above us, as you leave and contribute your messages of hope for the future. In looking at feeding 10 billion people and sustaining the planet, we know that by 2050, the world's population will increase to 10 billion and most people will have disp higher disposable incomes, which means they want to eat more, especially meat. To feed our growing population, the world will have to produce at least 70% more food, especially grain, but it'll have to do so using fewer resources. Can we feed the world without ruining the planet? Can we find new ways to produce more with less and ensure the benefits are available to all? Can a hungry wor world afford biofuels? Can genetically modified crops safely reduce the environmental footprint of agriculture, help us to adapt to climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and help with global nutritional security? In the series of short talks to follow, we'll have, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll have people discuss these ideas and then we'll have a panel discussion after that. But before I proceed further, I'd like to invite the director of the Festival of Ideas, Professor Fiona Stanley, to offer welcome of her own. Thank you, Richard, uh, Chair of Q&A and Stage and Screen. Um, very warm welcome to today's session. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledging them, also thinking about the way that their nutrition and their original diets, their hunter-gatherer diets, we are still hunter-gatherers and we've got the, one of the world's experts here, Karen O'Day, who's done research into the hunter-gatherer diet and how we've now changed into a diet which in our second session today we'll be discussing eating ourselves to death. Um, and of course the third session we'll be looking at food allergies which is a huge issue for children and parents today. But this morning's session that we're starting with is a very important one. And what we want with this Festival of Ideas is not just for you to sit here and take all the thoughts and, and uh, information that's going to be fed to you. We actually want you to think about it, challenge it, tweet it and get some ideas as to how we might best solve it. Because the students who have helped us plan this festival have said, we just don't want a festival that's going to talk. We want a festival that's going to do. So we're going to take all the ideas from each day and feed them into our last day's discussions of how in our current democracy, we're going to get these ideas into action. And that's the challenge of our final day. And then we'll be having, a, a, a if you like, a, a, a manifesto that's going to go from the festival to try and influence some of these uh, discussions further. So thank you so much for coming today and participating. And Richard, thank you for chairing what will be, I know, a fabulous session. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And before I, before I uh, mention our speakers, I'd like to acknowledge that our Vice Chancellor, Professor Glenn Davis, and Special Guest Maxine McHugh are here as well. So let me discuss, just briefly uh, give an overview of this morning's activities. We'll start off with a talk from Professor Prem Bala, who's the Associate Dean of Research in the Melbourne School of Land and Environment. She'll, she'll address what are the big issues in feeding our population. She'll be followed by Associate Professor Agnes Ritrock, who's um, with Agri Bio Agroparis Tech, and she'll be talking about uh, can genetically modified crops feed the world. Next will be Peter, uh, Professor Peter Gresshoff, who's um, the director of the ARC Center for Integrative Legume Research at the University of Queensland. He'll be speaking on should we be feeding our cars or our people, crop use to create biofuels. Next will be Associate Professor Simran Sethi, who's a journalist, strategist, and educator, speaking on social justice and sustainability implications of feeding a hungry planet. And finally, Professor Gary Egger, AM, who's Professor of Lifestyle Medicine and Applied Health Promotion at Southern Cross University, and he'll be speaking on health, ills, and economics. Have we ever shot the sweet spot? Now, throughout the program, there'll be, um, a, there'll be a Twitter feed for hashtags. They'll be using the Twitter feed, hash U-O-M-F-O-I, and you'll see that from time to time on the screen. And we want you to join the discussion via Twitter, but we really emphasize that we want to have critical insights and questions. They'll be really relayed to the front, where Ben will help identify the questions, uh, will be monitoring the questions, and will let me know when they've come in and help feed them to the podium. So um, at the very end, we'll have audience deliberation and polling, 
we'll be taking live audience feedback toward the end, and at the very end, we'll have a voting exercise at the, at the conclusion of the panel discussion and Q&A. So then, for the first speaker, Professor Prembala, who's addressing what are the big issues in feeding our population. Professor Bala received her PhD from the University of Punjab. She's a molecular biologist who has researched and published extensively in the area of plant genetics, breeding, and genetic technology. She'll be talking about what are the big issues feeding our population. Prem. Thank you very much, Rick. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, human race originated in Africa and started to disperse out about 85,000 years ago. Most of the time, we humans um, survived as hunters and gatherers, and we were wandering in most of the Ice Age period. But our world started to change around 10,000 years ago. Our climate became more stable. We started to eat goat, sheep, we started to cultivate grasses, started to build huts, villages, and societies. Our food production was based on selection. Something we liked, we saved seeds for replanting. Over centuries, we used this practice of effective selection for food production. As more food was required, we simply planted more land. We learned to live in a stable environment system and our population grows at a steady rate. But at the time of Christ, we had around 300 million people on this earth. It took us 1,800 years to reach 1 billion. Since 1930, our population increased at a significant rate, reaching over 7 billion this year. Nearly half of this population increase since 1930 can be attributed to most significant discovery in the history. The discovery of converting thin air nitrogen to fertilizer. The process is called after the inventor Haber Bosch. With the use of fertilizers led to increase in food production, resulting increase in population. In the absence of this discovery, our population would have been halved around 3 billion. That is, some of us in this room may not be here today. Still, basic pattern of our food production remains the same. That is, we needed more food, we cleared out more land. But at the beginning of 20th century, we started to realize that we are running out of agriculturally suitable land. In 1968, Stanford professor Paul Enrich published best-selling book at that time, conveying the warning of mass starvation due to population growth. But this forecast or warning was overturned by Green Revolution in 1970s, where high-yielding wheat and corn varieties um, converted countries like India from wheat imported to wheat exporter. Again, there was a plenty of food to go around. The Green Revolution was due to also improved agriculture practices, irrigation, use of pesticide, NPK fertilizers, and use of agriculture machinery. By 1990, we were adding around 95 million people every year on this earth which led to decline in per capita food production. At the world level, we have not much grain or staple food stored away for any days. At, at the most, we have only a couple of months supply food stored away. In 1950s, we used to catch enough fish to satisfy our demand, but from last two de decades, our food productivity per capita from the sea has declined. And same is true for meat production. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next 40 years, we need to produce more food than we ever produced in the whole human history. And also, we need to do this on the same amount of land. 
To give you an idea, in 1950s, we used to feed less than 2% per hectare, precisely 1.7% per hectare of land. And in year 2050, we need to feed 7% per hectare. How about our environment? Since industrial revolution, we have increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to 380 parts per million from 280. We also increase concentration of greenhouse gases, such as nitrous oxide and methane. The magic of nitrogen fertilizer, as I mentioned earlier, had cost. Converting thin air nitrogen to ammonia is energy intensive process. Around 15, 1.5% of nitrogen we add as fertilizer gets to our plates. Most of it gets wasted. Around half of it ends up in our waterways, rivers, and coasts. The excessive nitrogen and phosphorus runoff encourages algal blooms that you can see in this slide that lead to depletion of oxygen in the water, damaging marine life. Our Earth is getting warmer. Warmer climate will reduce crop yields. Global warming might trigger unpredictable weather, storms, and flooding that we saw close to home in Queensland in 2011. With global warming, we are also losing our water reservoirs in sky. Our mountain glaciers are rapidly disappearing. Himalayas and Tibetan glaciers sustains major rivers of Asia during dry period, uh, providing critical irrigation water for agriculture. Water is a potential limiting factor. Between 1950 to year 2000, world water uses has tripled. With the increase in population, water requirement by people is further increasing. By 2050, over 4 billion people will suffer from chronic water, water shortages. 70% of our fresh water is used for irrigation. Irrigation can lead to water shortages. Pumping water from the ground, as it's happening as we speak, in many countries like India, causing water tables to fall and wells to go dry. More seriously, fossil water stored deep down the earth, which cannot be replenished, is being used for agriculture. Agriculture production is energy intensive, requiring use of fossil fuel. We are at the peak oil use. We have also started to use food crops for biofuels. With the rise of middle class in India and China, we are, there is a growing appetite for meat. People want to eat more varied diet. Meat production requires much more resources like our precious water and energy. Just to give you an idea, to produce one kilogram of wheat grain requires approximately 1,300 liters of water while one kilogram of beef requires more than 16,000 liters of water, more than 10 times of water. Meat production is also energy intensive. Energy needed to produce a single hamburger is enough to power a small car for 30, kilome for, for 30 kilometers. In addition, cattle produces a lot of methane and carbon dioxide, which contributes to climate change. Though at this minute, we have probably enough food to feed our five, seven billion people, but we have one billion people who go to bed with empty stomach. Over 800 children would die in next hour due to hunger and malnutrition. That is around six million children per year. It is not only that we need to produce more food, but we also need to develop 
equitable system so that people can have affordable access to sufficient and nutritious food to live active and healthy life. So ladies and gentlemen, feeding population is a complex challenge. We need to look at the big pictures. We cannot look at one aspect in isolation. Therefore, my proposition is that we must invest in new and innovative solutions that lead to a food system that includes increased food production and equitable food affordability and availability while maintaining the health of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prem. And as Prem has just illustrated, every one of the speakers will end with um, a, pre a, a proposition about, um, about which we'll discuss later, things they think should be changed. So our next speaker is Pro Associate Professor Agnes Rickrock, who will discuss Can Genetically Modified Crops Feed the World? Professor Rickrock is the Associate Professor in Evolutionary Genetics and Plant Breeding at AgriParis Tech, France, and an adjunct professor at Penn State University in the United States. She holds a PhD in genetics and plant breeding from Orsay University. She received the Laureate 2012 Special Prize of the Academy of Agriculture of France and is a member of the Society of Writers of France. Her research focuses on agricultural innovation for achieving food security, the impact of genetically engineered plants on health and the environment, and bioethics. She has edited three books on the subject of transgenic plants and plant biotechnologies and has reviewed in detail safety studies of GM crops. Professor Rickroft. Thank you, uh, Rick. And um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the organizer for inviting me uh, to this very original festival of ideas. So thank you very much. Um, can genetically modified crops uh, help to feed the world is a big question, is also an important issue. Um, voilà. World population is predicted to grow to approximately 10 billion by the middle of this century. From now to mid-century, there will be a 34% increase in the number of people. Thus, the world is warming. Humans are behind most of the warming. Continued spraying of greenhouse gases would warm the world to dangerous levels by as early as mid-century, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change find on last Monday. Given limited uh, land suitable for crop production and population soon to exceed 10 billion, there is a need, an urgent need, to ensure food security while protecting biodiversity and our environment with less pesticides and fertilizers. There is also a need for us to reduce emission of greenhouse gases if we really want to stabilize climate. Only draconian emission reduction would avoid the serious consequences. Decreasing pesticides and fertilizer use in agriculture could have a positive impact on the health, on well-being of wildlife, biodiversity, decrease female and male farmers' exposure to chemicals, reduce emission of greenhouse gases, and contribute to a cleaner water supply. Thus, in this context of global warming, extremes of water and climate would also rise, increase. There is a need to improve the efficiency of water use for farm productivity. How can a world of limited resources possibly adjust to the food and sustenance needs of its people when their numbers will expand by more than one-third 
in a such a relative short period of time. Among the most successful and still more promising advances is modern agriculture, using agrobiotechnology, which is a range of processes to enhance foods through various plant breeding techniques and other techniques like agroecology or pest management, integrated pest management, notably. Agrobiotechnology is a science of employing the tools of modern genetics and bioinformatics, sequencing genomes to enhance beneficial traits of plants and their food components. Agrobiotechnology is one of the tools in the breeder's toolbox, and in some cases we will see together the only tool to meet the needs. Yield increase for major food crops is not fast enough to meet demand on existing farmland. Genetically, genetically modified varieties can improve yields. We observe 5% increase in corn yields in the US, while 24 increase in Philippines. Another example, we observe 10% increase in cotton yields in the US, in America, while 50% increase in India, according to the agroclimatic condition of each region. Each variety should be adapted to agronomic condition and is very important to consumers' preferences. In Spain, for example, in Europe, 100 varieties of corn are genetically modified with a gene which makes them resistant to a pest, a major pest in the south of Europe, the European corn borer. So the genetic engineering, like agrobiotechnology, uh, is not decreasing the diversity at all. In the contrary, scientists should protect, collect, and conserve wild species and traditional varieties of crops in order to discover new genes in their genome which can be useful for human needs. The public sector has a responsibility to collect, to protect, and to conserve the genetic resources for both major and half farm crops, uh, such as millet or legumes in developing regions. Genetically modified variety can reduce greenhouse gases. We observe that approx 20 uh, billion kilograms of carbon dioxide were saved in 2010. Genetically modified variety can reduce pesticides. They contribute to a 9% reduction, 443 kilograms of active ingredients were saved since 1996. GM varieties can contribute to, uh, to use less water. For example, using herbicide tolerant crops, laotil or no till at all, are possible for farmers and they reduce evaporation. The new drought tolerant crops, such as corn or rice, can be grown in dry in dry area like in America last year. Herbicide on crops can contribute to less soil erosion also. Indeed, reduce tillage, save topsoil. Finally, GM varieties can improve nutrition. The food itself can be more healthful and nutritious as crop with enhanced nutritional traits such as omega-3 fatty acids. This food can help to combat chronic disease by providing more healthful compounds, including higher level of antioxidants and vitamins, as in the golden rice, which is enriched with vitamin A. And 
lower amounts of saturated fat we should limit to protect sea health. Scientists also began to target allergy causing uh, proteins. But to increase food crop production, the main issue is the protection of crop against pathogens. For example, in this uh, figure, the majority of papaya in Hawaii are grown from genetically modified seeds produced by the public sector that are resistant to a ring spot virus that wiped out Hawaii's papaya in the 1950s. The genetically modified version is credited with saving Hawaii's 11 million of dollars papaya industry. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Against attack of virus, there is no chemical solution. And we know that chemical solution is not the best uh, solution. The only one solution is a genetic solution. So scientists discover a gene and introduce the gene into the genome of uh, varieties which become resistant to the virus. Here we observe that the virus resistant trees, papaya trees, survive after the virus attacked, while the non modified cannot survive. Agro biotechnology can help feed our growing planet, while also bringing several additional benefits along the way. We need to discover new genes and to develop new biotech crops varieties to address the 21st century challenge, hand hunger, increase crop yield without harming the environment, and preserve the genetic resources, including indigenous and traditional crop varieties. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Onis. Our next speaker is Professor Peter Gresshoff, who will address should we be feeding our cars or people crop use to create biofuels. Peter is a developmental plant biologist in the School of Agriculture and Food Science and the Chair of Botany at the University of Queensland. He was appointed as Director of the ARC's Center for Excellence in Integrative Legume Research in 2003. He's a Fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, the Russian Academy of Agricultural Science, and the Indian National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He uses molecular and genetic tools to understand the complexity of gene networks during the control of nodule formulation in legumes, and is a particular expert on biofuel. Peter. Well, thank you very much for that lengthy introduction. It makes my head swell, and I have to come down again. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak here, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Normally, in my life, I'm a molecular geneticist who's looking at soybean. And I'm trying to look at the genes which are controlling soybean nodulation and nitrogen fixation. But about six years ago, I felt it was worthwhile to expand my perspective, to look at the area of biofuel, especially as biofuels and energy are essential for uh, our continued existence. So if I can have the first slide, or if I can myself, yes. So the question is really, can we afford biofuel? Now the reason why we have that question is because biofuel is derived from plants, and plants grow on land, and they utilize resources which are used also for food production. So therefore, food and biofuel uh, come from the same source, more or less. And we can see that when we look at canola. I mean, people have used canola oil in order to make diesel, in order to drive cars. Well, canola oil is also food. Uh, Sugarcane is wonderful. In Queensland, we have huge areas of sugarcane which make ethanol, which then drives cars. But sugarcane and the sugar in it is also a food crop. So therefore, we have competing issues of uh, priority. My point is that there is no argument whether we should have biofuel or not. We must have biofuel. And the reason for it is because it's sustainable. 
There are a lot of energy sources that are sustainable as well. For example, wind energy and solar energy. And we all have been using electricity from those sources. But the problem is that electricity is an energy form which is not easily storable. So therefore, there's a difference between energy and fuel. So therefore, we need to have a fuel replacing the fossil fuel which we get out of oil wells and gas wells in order to drive our machinery, drive our airplanes, and run our electric, electrical production. So therefore, we must have uh, biofuel, but we must have it smartly. We must think and utilize our knowledge in order to get the optimal crop and to do it. And so, how do we face the global problems which exist not now? And these already have been covered by the previous two speakers very, very, very nicely. But I just want to reiterate that we both have a food and a fuel and energy problem. Right? The amount of oil which is in the Earth's reserves is about, is estimated to be about 160 trillion liters of total oil reserves. Now, I've spoken to oil company people, and they say, yes, there will be some new discoveries. We hear about them in the Arctic, for example, and you know, somewhere in the Brazilian jungle and so on. But these are all the small bubbles. The big bubbles have been discovered. So therefore, there's not going to be another Saudi Arabia, and there's not going to be another North Sea oil. Now, what is critical about this, about these reserves, is that there is a usage issue and that is that we're using 3.8 trillion liters, plus or minus 10% or so, each year of, of that oil. And you don't have to be a University of Melbourne graduate or so to uh, figure this out. You divide one by the other, and you see that there's about 40 years of oil left. Now, this may change, and I'm not, I'm not predictive of, of whether it's 40 years or 50 years or 30 years. The bottom line is we are going to run out of oil. Now, yes, we are going to have some natural gas. Yes, we have some coals, but there are environmental issues to that. As a matter of fact, while I've been waffling here and explaining this to you, each second, 120,000 liters of oil are being used. So that's really, really, really shocking. So what do we need? Well, we need a solar energy collecting crop. Well, most crops are, right? So we need to have something which efficiently grows and produces a yield. But the yield of the plant should be in oil, right? Because oil can be converted very, very easily by a process called transesterification to biodiesel, which we can put into our cars, or by the process of hydrogenation, so you add hydrogen to it, to aviation jet fuel. So therefore, there is a known chemical mechanism to do that conversion. What's important is that it's sustainable. And so therefore, we could do this all with oil palm, but uh, then we're inviting more and more acreages in Indonesia and Malaysia to be cleared. Presently, Indonesia is clearing 2 million hectares of forest. Now, that in influences the ecology of orangutan, et cetera, et cetera. So we cannot do that. We have to have something sustainable. And we have to have an oil which can be dropped in. Well, we have all of that. And the way that we have it is in that organism which I focused on about six years ago, and it's a tree. It's not a normal crop, it's just simply a tree. But amazingly, it's a legume tree. So as a legume, it can convert nitrogen gas from the air, the N2 which we breathe in and out. It can convert that in little structures on the root system called nodules. It can convert it to ammonia and the ammonia is a nitrogen fertilizer for the plant. This is why legumes are very, very versatile in conquering uh, marginal, uh, agricultural, uh, marginal land. You see it in the sand dunes and so on. So therefore, legumes don't require nitrogen fertilizer, which makes them extremely sustainable for production. The cost requirements and the environmental imprints are immensely reduced. Now, the Pongamia plant, and I'm only showing you a seedling here. You can see the seed and the emerging seedling, uh, harvests solar energy, water, and minerals. 
in order to grow up within four years to produce pods. It's just like a bean plant. And these pods are numerous. In Brisbane, we, the city council has planted trees, and these trees are for shade purposes and ornamental purposes. These, uh, these trees carry 10 to 20,000 seeds per tree. Now, each individual pod contains a seed, and the seed is about the size of your thumbnail. It weighs about two grams. And what is interesting is that that seed contains between 35 and 45 percent oil. Now, most of that oil is oleic acid, and so this is from olive oil equivalent type of thing. And oleic acid is a monounsaturated fatty acid, which is ideal for the conversion into biodiesel. We have done that in our laboratory and even run it in engines, so therefore the chemistry is straightforward. But the oil which comes out of the plant is not only use, usual, used for biodiesel, but also for aviation jet fuel, and also when you have the squeezing of the seed, you have animal feed residues, so you can use it as supplemental feed. You also have benefits that uh, you can get carbon credits, so therefore there's some economic ones. There's the issue of soil protection, which relates to green manure. So therefore it's a crop which has many, many, many advantage, uh, advantages to use. Okay, so therefore the, the, the trumps which the Pongamia plant really has is that its root system, as shown here, has these little organs which uh, all legumes have or most legumes have. And it, inside these organs, as shown here, you have an invasion of bacteria, a beneficial invasion, so that you have the conversion of nitrogen gas to uh, nitrogen fertilizer. So therefore you get free nitrogen Indeed, as the root system dies, uh, that nitrogen is released to the soil for the subsequent crop. The second benefit is that the plant, as I told you, produces seeds, as shown here, and which are very oil rich. And so therefore, from our calculations, from our work right now in different environments around Queensland, uh, I should say that the tree unfortunately does not grow in Victoria because it is, uh, it's warm enough, but not, the summer is not long enough. But the, the seeds develop beautifully in different environments in Queensland, in the wet tropics, in the dry tropics, and even in the areas which receive uh, winter frosts. So, for example, in collaboration with Origin Oil, uh, Origin Energy Company, and Stanwell Company, all of them huge energy consortia in the Queensland area, we have been planting Pongamia in order to select the genetic combination that yields best under those conditions. Even Queensland uh, has a huge abundance of environments. It's not all tropical. In some places, as in uh, Spring Gully for Origin Energy, it gets minus five, minus six degrees in winter. So this tropical tree will lo lose its uh, leaves, but yet uh, regenerate uh, as, as spring comes, as it is now. So therefore, our, our trials have shown that yields with the present knowledge and the present materials that we have in our hands can yield up to 5,000 uh, 5, liters per hectare. Now that's a huge oil yield, a huge energy yield, equivalent to oil palm, and about five times the size of canola or sunflower, etc. So we are very, very pleased with the possibilities of this crop plant. Okay, I come to conclusions. And I will actually read them out because I think they're important. We are really facing serious problems in food, water, land, and energy. And so therefore, sustainable biofuel production is really essential. If it's not sustainable, we're just simply wasting energy, space, and effort. And so biological nitrogen fixation, as it occurs in legumes, uh, is very sustainable, and so therefore has to be considered. And thus, Pongamia, the legume tree, which can do this process, and which is drought tolerant, and which is salt tolerant, and so on, has the ability to grow on non-agricultural land, on marginal land, in order to produce a yield. We have isolated superior elite uh, tree material and clones, and are testing those. 
And so therefore what we're doing actually, what you're facing is actually the development of a new industry. And it's fascinating for me as a scientist who normally looks at how molecules interact and what receptors and what signals are important in the biological process. And we are highly sophisticated in this language which uh, many of you uh, would not understand. It is fascinating how in this area we're looking at translational research. So we are translating knowledge from other areas into the area of biofuel in order to make advancement and, as I said, start a new industry. With that, I close, and I thank you very much for your attention. As you can see, Peter's proposition is we have to find a source of biofuels that is sustainable and does not compete with food production resources. Our next speaker will be Associate Professor Sibiran Sethi, who's going to address social justice and sustainability implications of feeding a hungry planet. Sibiran Sethi is an award-winning journalist and Associate Professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Kansas. She currently teaches sustainability and environmental communications and also serves on the Sustainability Advisory Board for the City of Lawrence, Kansas. She received a Master's in a Master of Business Administration and Sustainable Management from Presidio Graduate School at the City University of New York in 2005 after completing a Bachelor of Arts at Smith College in 1992. In 2009, she was awarded the Smith College Medal. Associate Professor Sadie has been named by the UK's Independent as one of the top 10 eco-heroes of the planet and was lauded as an environmental messenger by Vanity Fair. She has contributed numerous segments on television, such as the United States Nightly News, The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Today Show, Ellen DeGeneres Show, The Martha Stewart Show, and The History Channel. She's also been a featured guest on National Public Radio of the United States, and is the host of the award-winning, pardon me, the Emmy Award-winning public broadcasting system documentary, A School in the Woods. Can you please join me in welcome Senator on Sadie. Thank you all for the warm welcome, for the invitation to join you today. The question that we're trying to address is critically important. How do we feed a hungry planet? Now, this is a question that some businesses, policymakers, scientists, and NGOs would have you believe has a silver bullet answer. Make more food by any means necessary. Hybrid and transgenic seeds to increase yields, monocropping on large-scale farms to increase efficiency, synthetic chemicals to kill pests and weeds, and cheap labor to minimize costs. This is what we've been told. Now what I invite you to do is question these assertions and consider a new story. Feeding people requires more than cheap caloric intake, which is why the shape of malnutrition looks less like this and more like this. We are what writer Raj Patel calls stuffed and starved. Stuffed with corn, the same crop used in bioplastics, biofuels, and to feed livestock. Starved for real nutrition. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, there are now more people in the world who are overweight or obese than emaciated. This is the result of an increase in urbanization, sedentary lifestyles, and diets that increasingly prioritize processed foods. For the first time in human history, overweight people outnumber underweight ones. 870 million people are hungry. 1.5 billion people are overweight or obese. But... Both groups suffer from micronutrient malnutrition, including vitamin A, iron, or iodine deficiency. And the diseases that obesity makes more likely are predicted by the World Health Organization to be the leading causes of death in all countries, even the poorest ones, within a few years. Okay, but let's stay focused on those more starved than stuffed. How do we feed our hungry planet? The answer is, we already do. Or, 
Rather, we already can, today at 7 billion and in the future at 10 billion. Because for the past 20 years, the rate of global food production has increased faster than the rate of global population growth. The world already produces more than one and a half times enough food to feed everyone on the planet, which is enough to feed the population of 10 billion that we anticipate by 2050. So Simran, then why are people hungry? Because availability does not equal access. This abundance is not equally distributed. More than 60% of underfed people live in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The area is called hunger's center of gravity. And the irony is that fully half of these food insecure people are small farmers living on less than $2 a day. Because even though they grow food, they lack the means to meet all their needs through producing or buying food. Let me just repeat that. The largest group of people in the world growing food, peasant farmers, are too poor to buy food. Hunger is caused by poverty and inequality that begets food scarcity. And it's not limited to the developing world. In Australia, people spend $158 billion on food and throw as much as 20% of it away while some 2 million Australians struggle to put food on the table and 14 million are overweight and obese. Wasted food is a waste of energy, water, labor, money, all of the resources used to produce, process, store, and transport our food. Globally, one-third of food is lost or wasted. Okay, so let's get back to the cost that we see. Australians, on average, spend 11 to 15 percent of their disposable income on food. So there's one group that is an exception to that, and that is Aboriginal communities that spend closer to 35 percent of their income on food. And I hope to better understand this discrepancy during my time here in Melbourne. Let's extend this out to the rest of the world. Indonesians spend 44% of their disposable income on food. Kenyans spend 45% of their income on food. Italians, 13%, and the list goes on and on. But I want you to consider this. What happens to your diet and to your budget when the price of food goes up? And not when you're spending one-tenth of your income on food, but when you're spending one-half or one-third of your income on food. Rice, maize, and wheat provide 60% of our global caloric intake. The prices of these foods have risen exponentially in the last decade. In the case of maize, prices have nearly tripled. Why this volatility? Because we're turning this food into fuel and feed. Let's start with biofuels, not the legumes that were just discussed, the ones that are in production now. The world's biggest producers of ethanol are in the United States and in Brazil, and they're responsible for over 87% of the world's production. Now, to produce these fuels, the two countries dedicated over 460 million tons of maize and sugarcane to edible crops, which in 2020, uh, 2010 excuse me, was 6% of global crop production. Supply and demand are dynamic, as anyone in this room with an MBA can tell you, right? And they cause price fluctuations. But the reallocation of cropland to grow fuel rather than food, coupled with an increasing demand for meat as developing countries accrue more wealth, and trade agreements and policies that favor large-scale agriculture and push subsidies, they've completely distorted the market and what people are paying for food. The people who would have you believe that hunger is solely the result of increasing population rates in the developing world, right, of brown people who look like me, they're obfuscating deeper systemic problems that are easily masked by the refrain to make more food by any means necessary. Availability does not equal access. Any efforts to feed people have to consider the source of food along with distribution and waste. 36% of the calories produced by the world's crops are used for animal feed. And only 12% of those feed calories ultimately contribute to the human diet as meat 
and other animal products. The world's croplands could feed four billion more people than they do right now by shifting from animal feed and current biofuels production to exclusively producing food for human consumption. Okay, now what growing crops for direct human consumption means is eating a plant-based diet or eating wild animals. 75% of all agricultural land is dedicated to animal production. And that livestock is responsible for about 18% of the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. One of the smartest things we could do is stop eating animals. But as I mentioned earlier, as people accrue more wealth, they eat more meat. This shift is known as the livestock revolution, and it's estimated 40% of the world's population will increase their animal consumption by the year 2050. And I get it, because I love meat. <laughs> But what researchers have found is even a partial shift in consumption from crop-intensive beef to pork and chicken could feed an additional 357 million people. And a shift to non-meat diets that include eggs and milk could feed an additional 815 million people. Cutting our consumption of grain-fed animals and animal products by 50% would feed an additional 2 billion people. And it's not just what we grow, but how we grow it, or what we raise, but how we raise it. The Rodale Institute study, which is the longest running study comparing conventional agriculture with organic methods, has found that organic yields grown without synthetic pesticides and fertilizers from non-transgenic seeds match conventional agriculture in good years and outperform them under drought conditions and environmental distress. The, con the conditions that we're facing right now with glo global warming. We need to, as you've seen from the previous speakers, increase the productivity on the land we have with the resources we have, especially as those resources dwindle, the population increases, and the world warms. There may be a place for transgenic crops, commonly called GMOs, within this model, but that is not the silver bullet solution. Macroeconomic indicators show that in the United States, which is the number one country growing biotech cro crops, food insecurity rose from 12% in 1995, the year before GM adoption, to 15% in 2011. In Paraguay, where nearly 95% of soy and 40% of maize is genetically modified, the Global Hunger Index indicates 13% of people were food insecure in 2004, when genetic engineering was first introduced, and nearly 26% of people were hungry in 2011. Now, let me explain why. That's because most of the transgenic crops that we grow today are for fiber, fuel, and animal feed, not food. 81% of global plantings of genetically modified crops are soy and cotton. 35% is maize. And these seeds, to a large degree, are owned by large agribusinesses that require farmers to purchase new seeds year after year. The sustainable way to feed 7 billion or 10 billion people is farming like a diversified ecosystem, tending to the soil, exercising moderation in inputs, conserving water, and growing crops in polycultures, not endless rows of single crops. Because those monocultures beget a mono diet. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, of the 80,000 edible plant species available, we only cultivate about 150. Approximately 95% of our calories come from just 30 species. Reducing hunger isn't just about increasing the quantity of food, but about increasing the quality of food in terms of biodiversity and nutrient content. Humans have been manipulating nature through agriculture for 12,000 years, but the modification that is called for now is cultural, not genetic. Agriculture, explains philosopher and farmer Wendell Berry, must mediate between nature and the human community with ties and obligations in both directions. Eating, Barry reminds us, is an agricultural act. The solutions to these problems belong to every one of us. 
Our demand for more meat and cheap food strains and constrains both farmers and food systems. Agriculture is a commercial activity and we need to pay more attention to where that money is going and who benefits from the food that we buy. We need to reconsider our relationship with our ecosystem and with what it means to eat well, with what it means to be nourished. The only way to feed our hungry planet is to ensure everyone has a seat at the table and that all farmers are compensated for these efforts. What is required for food security is not only production, diversification, and redistribution of food, but reallocation of power and wealth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Our, our next speaker is Professor Gary Egger, who's a uh, professor of lifestyle medicine and applied health promotion for Southern Cross University. He'll address health, ills, and economics. Have we overshot the sweet spot? He's one of Australia's leading authorities on lifestyle and chronic disease and provides counsel to the Australia medical community, the federal government, and the World Health Organization. He was previously a member of the National Health and Medical Research Council Committee on the Prevention, prevention of Obesity in Australia. He's written 30 books at over 160 peer-reviewed publications and is a principal author on uh, the NH MRC National Clinical Guidelines for Weight Control and Obesity Management. He also de developed the National Physical Activity Guidelines for the Australian Federal Government and the World Health Organization. In 1990s, he initiated the Gut Busters Men's Weight Loss Pro Program. I got a sign up for that one. The first of its kind in the world, which is now developed in the Professor Trim's Weight Loss Program for Men, and is one of the initiators of the Australian Lifestyle Medical Association. Uh, pardon me, the Australian Lifestyle Medical Association and runs training programs in lifestyle medicine for doctors and allied health professionals. Gary. Thank you, Rick. After that great introduction, I'm really interested to hear what I've got to say. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I've, uh, Susan Sontag once said that uh, uh, any disease whose causality is murky and for whom uh, the treatment is ineffectual, is a wash in significance. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's a bit of a transition from the previous speakers because I'm going to relate uh, agriculture to health and I feel um, uh, um, able to do this now because one of my particular areas of interest is the combination of obesity and climate change. And I'm involved in a major project looking at obesity and climate change, they both have similar causes. So I've got three main uh, points that I want to make in the short time I have available. The first point is that as an epidemiologist and epidemiologists that work in this area, we can't just look at the cause of a disease. We have to look at the cause of the cause of a disease and then the cause of the cause of the cause of a disease. My second point then is if we do this and we take the cause of the disease back to its distal cause, not just its proximal cause, that's the immediate thing that causes the disease, to its distal cause, then we have to look at the economic situation in which, in which we live and particularly the economic growth situation that we revere so much and that we expound, uh, that has to be exponential in order for us to thrive and survive. And my third point is if we're going to deal with this, we have to think laterally. We can't think in the old ways of blaming the victim, of saying to the victim, it's your fault, uh, you have to change your lifestyle, we have to educate you to change your lifestyle. So let me start by first defining what an epidemiologist does. Epidemiologists look at the cause of disease, as I say. But if you want to look at the root cause of any disease, you have to go back to what caused that cause. Geoffrey Rose, the great English epidemiologist in 1996, said that when uh, we have this rise in chronic diseases, which has now taken over from infectious diseases, that it's not enough to just look at 
the end point because we don't really know what the cause is. And in fact, cause in epidemiology is a very vexing term. We can't really define ever what the cause is when it comes down to chronic diseases. There's different type of epidemiologists. There's infectious disease epidemiologists. There's acute disease epidemi uh, epidemiologists. There, there is chronic disease epidemiologists. Uh, and, but they all deal with the same, uh, the same basic structure, and that is looking to the cause of disease and then ha what we do about that cause of disease. Now, an infectious disease epidemiologist might, for example, look at uh, a salmonella outbreak that occurred in Melbourne, let's say, last week. And it's easy enough to say that that outbreak occurred in a restaurant in Melbourne, but that gets us nowhere. We have to look at which restaurant. We ha have to look at the type of food that was served. We have to look at the people that ate that food. Infectious diseases have been on the wane over the last 50 years. There's a little tick at the end of the, the drop in that graph, of course, because of the new infectious diseases that have come up. But chronic diseases, that is non-communicable diseases, have taken over from these. And 70% of diseases at the moment, the burden of diseases in the world, is taken up by chronic diseases. So we have to do the same thing as the infectious disease epidemiologist and say that the cause of something such as obesity, and I'm going to use obesity here as an example because it's the area that I'm most familiar with, although I have to say that I don't think obesity is a disease. I've changed my mind on this over the last 20 years. I think obesity is a risk factor, and I think it's a signal, it's a canary in the mine shaft that's warning us that something is going wrong in society. People don't die of obesity, they die of things that uh, are associated with obesity and of the things that cause obesity in the first place. So when we look at the cause of the cause of chronic diseases like obesity, we go from uh, overnutrition and inactivity, which is what everybody puts it down to. If you listen to the radio shock jocks, it's just people are eating too much and not exercising enough. But people don't do that without a reason, just as people don't smoke and get cancer because they're born with an urge to smoke. They smoke because society encourages them to smoke. And then behind society and the family and peer pressure encouraging, encouraging them to smoke uh, is the bigger society, the economic society, which says that if you don't smoke, our economy will suffer. 9% of gross domestic product of the way in which we measure our economic well-being is taken up with cigarettes, drugs, and alcohol. So in other words, the more we smoke, drink, uh, and take drugs, the healthier our economy will be next year, <laughs> even though we will be sicker next year. <laughs> Think about it. Gross, that's our measure of gross domestic product. That's our measure of well-being. And when we take that back to obesity, it comes down to this big issue of economic growth. Now, John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s, who was the modern instigator of the economic growth system, even though it started in the, uh, after the Industrial Revolution, said we may have to grow for 100 years, but after that, nothing can grow forever. We must change our economic system. Growth, by definition, exponential growth cannot continue. You've all heard of the example, let me quote it again, of lilies in a pond. You start off with one lily one day. Uh, within, let's say, 100 days, the, the growth of lilies gets to half of the pond. And that in itself may be interesting, but the more interesting fact is that it only takes one more day before the pond is full of lilies. One extra day and you've got two ponds. Two extra days and you've got four ponds. But where do you get that four ponds if there's only one pond in which the lilies grow? So my third point uh, then is if economic growth is, the, is one of the drivers of chronic disease as signalled by obesity, and, and we know that because the term to consume means to eat, to overindulge, to drink. Our Prime Minister told us last week, the week before the election, sorry, that we all had to go out and buy a car on the weekend <laughs> without thinking that that consumption is leading to people becoming obese. What are we interested in? Are we interested in the economy? Are we interested in the well-being of people? So I move then to my third uh, suggestion, and that is how do we deal with this whole issue of economic growth? 
Sorry, I, I didn't point out that uh, one of the areas of research that I've been interested in is looking at economic growth around the world and its association with obesity. And when you look at countries that have high rates of obesity, they are the seven countries that are also English-speaking countries, that is Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, uh, and one or two others which I've just forgotten for the time being. They're all English-speaking countries. Now, a very bad epidemiologist would say that speaking English leads to <laughs> obesity. When you look at that in a little more detail, it's not just the growth model that means that we're going to increase obesity. It's the fact that different, there are different political ways of getting to that end means of economic growth. There is what's called hard capitalism, that is non-fettered, unregulated capitalism, and there is soft capitalism. Hard capitalism, hard capitalism is more characteristic of those seven countries that I just talked about, the English-speaking countries. Soft capitalism, more, more characteristic of the Scandinavian countries. And when we look at all health indices, not just obesity, but all health indices, those countries that have the bigger gap between the rich and the poor fare worst on all of those indices. So we've got these two things operating against us. We've got economic growth, which means that we have to grow exponentially every year in order to survive. And we've got the fact that if we've got a hard political system that drives that, the, equi the, the inequality becomes greater between the rich and the poor, and that leads to greater ill health problems, chronic disease problems in particular, and as signaled by obesity, which is the canary in the mine shaft. So my last point then is what do we do about this? I mean, obviously, we have to get to a, state of a steady state economy, ultimately. We have to also look to population, and we've heard a lot this morning about how population is inevitably going to grow to 10 million. We have to consider why does it inevitably have to grow to 10 million. I mean, that's the basis of, of much of our problems, but it's also the way in which we grow economically. It's the lazy man's way. It's the lazy businessman's way of growing economically. You just get more people because they buy more, more goods and consume more stuff. How do we deal with it? It's, it's not going to be an easy conversion to a steady state economy. So let's pick the lowest hanging fruit. And what I'm going to suggest here might shock you a little bit because I think that the lowest hanging fruit comes in something that you may not realise, and that is in restricting the lobbying uh, of lobby groups to politicians. We know uh, that this is possible, that we can do it. We know that lobbying, for example, of the food industry, if ever, if ever any of you like me have sat on food labelling uh, committees with eight or nine food company executives and one or two poor little whimpering health experts like myself trying to compete against them, that you just don't get anywhere with them. We know that uh, uh, the, the national food guidelines which have just come out have nothing in it about the environment, even though we've heard this morning how important the environment is, because of lobbying. We know that you don't have a railway to the airport out here, so I have to get a taxi back this afternoon because of lobbying. These people didn't exist 30, 40 years ago. They are now controlling the world, and they are making a mockery of democracy in our system. So my last point is we need to think laterally. <laughs> We need to think laterally, such as by introducing public funding of election campaigns, if we are to have any effect on obesity and chronic disease rates in Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Now, Gary, don't go too far, because we're going to come back. I want to invite all, all the speakers to come back to, the, um, to, to, to sit the chairs up here as a part of the panel so we can entertain questions and tweets from the audience. So um, at this point, you'll be able to turn your phones back on, maybe preferably on silent, and uh, you'll be able to um, tweet to um, Ben. Ben, uh, ben Kaufman is with the Melbourne University Debating Society, and he'll help um, feed questions up to me. And um, also, while we're getting seated, I think it'd be a, good, a great time for us to thank Ben and all the other people who helped put the program together for the Festival of Ideas today. So thank you all. With that, we're, we're, I'm happy to um, welcome questions from the audience. Yes, Fiona, of course. Uh, start with Fiona. Ooh. Oh, well. Yeah. Go ahead. Stephen. Um, something that mystifies me is the opposition to GM foods. 
and um, um, perhaps Rick could also comment on this, it seems a no-brainer that it's an important part of our armoury. And yet, there seems to be an irrational response to it, and some countries that are starving that could benefit enormously from GM foods reject having it introduced into the agriculture cycle. The reason I'm so mystified by it is because, to the best of my knowledge, there's been no example of GM foods having any adverse effect on humans in the entire history of it being uh, deployed. To what do we attribute this irrational, irrational, I'm not saying that it's a silver bullet, but it is an important part of the armory. Why this opposition? Why is society, such deep societal antipathy towards this very valuable technology? Let that Anya's try first. Uh, thank you very much for your question because it's uh, almost the same question uh, which come up. Um, I think there is several um, response to your question um, about the opposition to GM crops. First of all, the monopoly. You know, only five major seed companies are doing GM crops. Why? First, because the uh, public sector drops to, uh, to breed crops. Before, before the genetic engineering is starting, for example, in Europe and especially in France uh, in the mid 80s, the public sector says it's too much money to, to input to create new varieties, uh, we allow the private sector to do that. Secondly, um, the risk assessment, especially in Europe, is time consuming, but is very expensive. Now, it's very difficult for small seed companies or new startups or public institutes they cannot afford this kind of um, um, uh, 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 proof for safety assessments. The, the more uh, uh, safety assessment, the more price is higher. So they contribute to do the monopoly. So we should, you know, break down this monopoly and to um, push small seed private companies, but also public institute to come back in the, in the, in the breeding uh, uh, area. Um, the second argument against... Um, maybe, maybe just we can have some other questions. Okay, I'll just add so a little bit and we'll just it's keep a major going. argument. <laughs> but but uh, Stephen, well, no, I mean, there's lots of reasons why people oppose GM crops in it, you know, it's, it's a strong, there's a lot of it strongly psychological, and it's not, it, it's not necessarily much influenced by the data that are available. But, yeah, the, probably the most exa example of what you're talking about was when the Zambian government rejected GM corn, corn supplies to the United States on the grounds it might be poisonous. Where in fact, there's strong evidence that um, insect-resistant corn has far lower levels of humonizens than the Africans we've been growing already. It was actually safer. It wasn't poisonous. The, the corn they were growing is the poisonous one. Yeah. One more yeah. point to it, um, because the first generation of GM crops was more geared towards benefit those companies and farmers. There was nothing for the consumers, um, for public uh, can see the benefit of it. When you go to buy your food, if you can buy food which has a high quality, more nutrient balance, but what we talked about, diet which gives you personal benefit, um, uh, you will be more, uh, more acceptable. As, as the, this food will be more acceptable. So, that's a fiona. Fantastic session, raising lots of issues. I wanted to make uh, one suggestion that if we are worried about the uh, harmful effects of uh, GM crops on human health, there's other issues that people might raise in terms of agricultural. But uh, is the epidemiologists of the world, Gary, have got together and uh, do some randomised control trials, stating what particular harmful effects might biologically be plausible, and then do the trials, um, commenting on uh, the. Uh, the, the uh, food industry doing the new evil and uh, overconsumption being pushed for profit. We took nine years after randomised control trial evidence of folate preventing neural tube defects to get that into the flour. The food industry, I was amazed, was our big enemy. But my question to the whole panel is, the UK climate, uh, head of the, uh, the politician, the climate uh, 
uh, change uh, minister in the UK has recently said that actually uh, climate uh, change and warming in the UK will be good because, of course, Britain won't have so many deaths related to cold, they'll be able to grow new crops. Um, and uh, I just wonder what the panel think of such a suggestion. Where is this guy getting his evidence? <laughs> Peter, you want to try that one? Although I spoke on biofuels, uh, I also know about other agricultural issues. Uh, it is true, if the world temperature is two degrees warmer, plants will grow better. I mean, there's no argument, but the scientific evidence has been published, and I can give people the references, that this increase of the ecosystem to increase CO2 levels is completely nitrogen dependent. And since there is no increased production of nitrogen fixation foreseen, we have to uh, look at uh, inability to respond in the growth. I'll yeah, go, just the, the next question you're here, but go ahead. Sure, go ahead. I'll just add to that. When we talk about increased growth of plants, we're also talking about increased growth, growth of weeds and increased growth of pests, which results in increased disease. So it's, it's not as simple as just saying more things will grow. You have to look at the kinds of systems and what exactly will be increasing. I, I, think, I think it's also important to, to note that it's the dose that's the poison. And what isn't recognised by many of the climate change deniers is that carbon dioxide in certain levels is, is positive. But once you get beyond a level, we know now from uh, one study that's been produced uh, in particular, that if you put rats in a cage and you expose them to uh, an excess of carbon dioxide, equivalent to the amount that we're just about to get to at the moment, they suffer, they, they actually overeat and they become obese because it changes their uh, receptive mechanisms in the brain that, that are involved in hunger. Now, there's a whole range of other factors, but it's the dose that's the, the, the poison. So repeat that over and over again to your shock jocks as they claim that carbon dioxide is plant food. Yeah, question? Um, yes, I think that hemp is something that addresses a lot of issues. Uh, it can make oil, it can be used for building, it can be used for fodder, it grows on marginal land, it doesn't seem to require as much fertiliser or water as cotton, for instance. So I wonder uh, why the panel don't mention hemp and if they see that it could and should be part of uh, what we're trying to do to remediate all these different areas of problem. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick answer. I mean, hemp isn't a short answer to everything either. I mean, it has some advantages, and there's probably lots of reasons why it should be used for fiber and so forth. Um, my suspicion is as soon as you start growing all the broad acres that you see for cotton, it would get hammered by insects as well. Yeah, question, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, what is the uh, response of the speakers to the work of Vandana Shiva, who has uh, challenged corporate control of uh, food production, which includes genetically modified foods and biofuels, and discusses uh, a need for earth democracy, which would be an alternative uh, system, world system, that is based on uh, things like uh, democracy uh, and um, social justice and environmental sustainability. Any responses? I'd like to start and say um, I agree with Dr. Shiva, and she's not alone in, in questioning sort of the corporatization of our food system. I want to just give you a few numbers here. Um, the top 10 commercial seed companies now own 73% of the market. 10 companies, 73% of market share. In 1995, they had 37% of market share. And one company, Monsanto, has 27% of the market share for commercial seed. And that is the same company that, of course, um, you know, is what Gary was talking about, is lobbying heavily for certain kinds of agricultural policy. And, and so what I would say is diversity is incredibly important in our food system. And the consolidation of this is something that we should all pay attention to. We should know where the money that we spend on food goes and know where that food comes from, what the source of the seed is. Um, yes, but now there is new um, actors uh, to do plant breeding and genetically modified crops. The universities in China, in Brazil, are now uh, um, creating new varieties with uh, public funding. 
the second new actor is um, um, foundation, I Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett Foundation, and they are working and funding um, a public institute in, uh, in Africa, for example. So I think something in changing against the monopoly, are, you, you, you said uh, uh, through the Shiva Shina uh, uh, talk, I think something in changing, and there is new actor, and perhaps in 10 years we will see a new crop, new orphan crops, uh, which will be more uh, adapted to the climate change, to, uh, to, to pest, and uh, to, to improve uh, yields and uh, also nutrients. So wait and see. I just want to I differ a little bit with Simran's analysis of the problems at the seed level. Because you, you can just watch the media and what farmers in Australia say, and they're not actually concerned about the seed supply. They're concerned about retail. They're concerned about milk prices, duopolies and markets, or about major grain marketers and so forth. It's probably the greater pressure is not at the seed level, but at the retail end, at, at the end of the picture. That's where farmers seem to be most worried about it. Well, we had a tweet. Uh, yeah. yeah, we had a tweet. No, he, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so Ben's going to read out a tweet question for us. Uh, yeah, so we've got a question in via Twitter um, for Professor Greshoff, and it's from Tess Taylor Sabalta, who asks, um, with regards to uh, the uh, research that you've done, which shows that you can grow plants which naturally re re uh, release nitrogen, uh, whether it is possible to grow these legumes beside other crops um, in, in lieu of uh, nitrogen fertilizers as a form of natural fertilization. Right. There's, there's extensive evidence that you can intercrop legumes with non-legumes. And indeed, uh, Mexicans have done this for probably thousands of years, uh, growing beans and corn and together. Um, so therefore, for the uh, biofuel oil crop, it is very, very natural to have intercropping and have actually advances or advantages for the soil itself. So therefore, you can grow a biofuel crop and grow a food crop, for example, in between. Because the trees are spaced at a certain distance, there is enough so, uh, solar in, uh, energy input so that for four months or so, another crop can grow. Do we have a question up front here? Thank you. Hello. I'd like to say absolutely fantastic presentations from all five. We've all learned a lot today, I'm sure. Um, my question comes in from the world of cancer genomics. I recently heard Sir Peter, uh, Sir John Byrne from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne Medical School, who's a clinical geneticist, and he reported that there's this very interesting body of research showing that aspirin, or salicylic acid particularly, can actually reduce um, the incidence of cancer, certain cancers gastrointestinal cancers, for example. And the very interesting thing that came out with a whole lot of world uh, scientists on this subject was that they found that um, years ago, all plant crops had a higher uh, quantity of silic acid naturally occurring. And with modern agricultural methods, the percentage of salicylic acid has actually fallen. We have growing incidence of cancer in the world. It would be an interesting use of GM research to actually increase the, the um, content of salicylic acid in plant crops for human food and nutrition to reduce the burden of cancer. Okay, any comments? Um, plant do uh, produce salicylic acid um, in response to pathogens, um, uh, sometimes as a communication between plants when something wrong happened in the environment. But I'm not aware of whether any program in place to increase for, for health purposes. No, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think, wait, um, go ahead, Gary. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think it's, it's tackling a, a fine point, but it's tackling the problem the wrong way. It's a bit like giving uh, a, a whole group of sick people anti-inflammatories to take whilst they're still doing the thing that causes the sickness in the first place. So unless we do something major for the environment and for the economic system and the, and the uh, political system that we live in, we're not really tackling the problem at its distal cause. Sure. And one of the interesting things that came out of that research so, was that... Well, actually, well, I think we need to move on to other questions. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the question... Uh, look, there's somebody right behind you. Let's take one close. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's, there's one here. 
Okay, go to, ahead. It's to, uh, my question is to do with the um, safety of GM foods. Um, uh, m uh, most studies uh, are carried out by the, um, industry or, or by scientists supported by the industry. And so it's in the interests of the industry, obviously, to prove that there are no health effects. And often those um, tests um, or um, trials, rather, feeding trials on animals, are usually very um, short term, about three months. Whereas independent scientists, um, somebody I'm um, at, at the um, Rout Institute in Scotland, um, I forget his name, starts with P. Anyway, and various other scientists. Oh, okay. Let's yep, that's it, yep. Um, who did carry out, oh, uh, uh, Professor um, Dr. Gorman here in Adelaide, um, 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 Seralini in France, Professor Seralini in France, have carried out um, long term tests of uh, six months or more. And um, it is only actually when they get to about six months that the health effects do show up, not on shorter term three month trials. And um, things like with Dr. Um, Gorman, the inflamed stomachs of pigs and with rats having tumours in serolinis. Anyway, the point is, a lot no, of these... It, a, your, uh, my question, question is, my question question? is um, well, a lot of these uh, tests have, um, trial, uh, people who've carried out these trials actually have been targeted by Monsanto and they've less, or the GM uh, companies and have lost their jobs. Now, I just, you know, wonder what your opinion is on this. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just insert that, to the best of my knowledge, these people have never been losing their jobs. But I would assert that, in fact, the opposite has been happening. Some people who have challenged him have been threatened with lawsuits. And indeed, a Peruvian science was threatened with a jail term. Because in Peru, you could have criminal libel charges. He was actually given a suspended jail sentence because he challenged a claim that was made. But uh, uh, Agnes is quite an expert on the safety studies that have been done. Yes, I I'm giving a, a lecture next week on this, on this problem. So um, feel free to, uh, to come to the uh, Dean's conference. Um, the Serralini uh, study uh, was refuted by uh, all the scientific community. And um, so the, the long-term uh, feeding study uh, was not well conducted. Um, we, uh, we, we did um, a review of the literature uh, on the long-term studies. Um, 34 studies we, we look at. And the results were there is no uh, effect on health. Why? Because when you uh, uh, create a genetically crop, you should compare to the content part without the gene. If there is no differences in terms of metabolized proteins, proteins vitamins, etc., uh, the scientists and the safety assessment uh, experts decide that they are equivalent. It's a first step. It's a, a substance equivalence. In Europe, <coughs> because we have a strong um, attitude towards uh, Prankosioni uh, principle, because of the uh, because we, we have some uh, problems with uh, with um, contaminated uh, blood in Europe. I don't know if you remember that. And the MATCO, you know. So we are aware about the safety in, uh, in food in general in Europe. So we did now a 90-day feeding study to check if perhaps there is an intended effect we cannot be uh, observed in the equivalent substance. And we made a review of that uh, with my colleagues, 100 studies of 90 feeding studies, OK? And there is no health effect. So it's, it's no way to do longer, you know, to feed an animal for, for two years. You can do that if you have a suspicion. You do that. Because you are uh, testing um, a, t a toxic uh, product, but a food is not toxic at all, you know. Let us stop that. So, so as Anya said, that she'll have. She's giving a lecture on our, our dean's lecture series next no Tuesday night at 5:30, and it's going to be 
at the um, uh, Turner Theater in Botany. And I'll just reiterate, over 100 studies. In fact, there have been some nine generation studies undertaken in part by the German Organic Institute. I think we had a question here next. Yes. Needless to say, thanks to all the speakers. Excellent talk. And I have different question, in fact. Just to touch on what Gary said, would increasing productivity feed the world without solving our political system, starting from the United Nations downward, and stop these dictators all around the world destroying farm, killing animal, burning land, intoxifying soil and water? Was that for me? <laughs> Yeah, that's a big Gary. Uh, Gary. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that, to be quite honest. I mean, uh, I'm a health scientist, uh, and I've, I've delved into economics. I did a basic degree in economics uh, when, I, when I started. Uh, but I've been forced into the area of economics because I think you can't talk about health without talking about the, the bigger field of economics. But when I talk to economists, they look at me with glazed eyes. When I talk to health scientists about economics, they look at me with glazed eyes. Uh, I'm one of the few in the country that's taken a step, and, and I'd feel very uncomfortable with, with either group because I'm not an expert in either group. We need people, cross-disciplinary people, to come in and do this sort of work to pull together. I'm just an ideas man. <laughs> Well, one very, at the very, at the very back, as we try really hard. So I think we'll probably be close to the last question before we start to go to the poll. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, your presentation. Um, what um, effective uh, improvements will uh, perhaps this kind of uh, uh, project, um, scholarly and educative project, will, will, will do to, 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 to the things that you have uh, signified in your presentation? And also, what um, th th this question is to perhaps to, to those who have uh, knowledge in pu public policy. And uh, what is organic? Th and this uh, the, 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 the um, next question is: what, what exactly is organic food? How would you compare uh, the contemporary organic food to pre-industrial uh, forest mass-produced food? In what way they are same, and how, how they are different? And also, uh, Professor uh, Sethi, um, you mentioned uh, uh, on late line earlier that uh, people are becoming uh, uh, aware of the, what's happening. So it seems there, there has been uh, appearance of uh, what's so-called environmental activism, or some may refer them as environmental terrorism, terrorism in um, uh, culture in public culture uh, uh, industry that their end product which is a a, 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 a a popular film so so I perceive this that as a, a appearance of well in the same realm people are becoming aware of what's happening maybe I'll, well what can you paraphrase the question yeah, for me <laughs> Not quite. I think he, she, he indicated. I think you were arguing that you, that uh, in her la late late line um, appearance, Semarino was arguing that change is already occurring. And to what uh, extent uh, do people uh, uh, aware uh, are uh, are aware uh, of this perhaps uh, the current uh, condition? Okay, so Aware if you... What condition? I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the environmental degradation and, and the, its future right. implications. The extent to which people are aware of environmental degradation. Well, I think it depends what, uh, what people and, and what area of degradation we're talking about. I think what, what my larger concern is, and I'm not sure if, if this is what you mean, is that um, environmental awareness and engagement is not certainly the same as what you called environmental terrorism and that we all have a vested interest in our environment. There's not a single person on this panel who doesn't want to feed people. We have very different ways of thinking about it, but we all have the same goal. And so, um, and I think what we're concerned with is really teasing out, will an increase in a certain kind of crop help feed people? What does distribution look like? How much of this are we throwing away? What are the health impacts of this? And that we really have to look at this comprehensively. There's not one 
solution here, but there are, there are myriad ways to tackle it. And that this is a reciprocal relationship. If you're expecting researchers to solve the problem, we're in big trouble because we're all eaters and we all have agency in this. And this responsibility belongs to all of us. But, but feed people, but not overfeed some people. Yes, yes, yes. Or underfeed others. <laughs> I'll just, just very quick, because I think we've run out of time for questions. So I'll just finish off one last question, your point about how has organic agriculture changed. It's important to remember that really the advent of nitrogen fertilizers, although first um, developed as technique was about 1910, its widespread use was about 1940, 1950. That was about the time when synthetic pesticides were first being introduced, um, DDT followed by a, few other, by a few herbicides and so forth. So essentially all agriculture was organic before say about 1940. What's the difference now? The difference now is that the level of organic agriculture, or the approaches people take, is, is a lot more sophisticated in terms of looking at patterns of how we can crop. Um, the, I mean, in, 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 I think, for me, the future of agriculture will look much more like a system that's, some, that's rather organic, but still uses um, judicious synthetic inputs, that we look at the kind of work, the bioprospecting that's been done by organic farmers and combine it with other techniques moving into the future. But there's a whole range of things. So a lot of research has been done over the last 60 years that really refines organics, I think. With that, I think we're, we're pressed by time, so it's pretty, pretty indicative this, that um, this discussion got lots of people going. And now we're ready to vote on, on the propositions that people had. So those are the instructions about how to vote. And on, on the screen now, um, you can see the propositions that, each, that have been put forward by our five speakers. And so we've got 14, 13, it's a big countdown. Anybody would join me at the countdown? 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And there we have it. <laughs> Stand up and take a bow, Gary. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thanks again to all the staff that have been helping us. I'm sure there will be lots for you to discuss over lunch to come. Thank you. Thank you.